You know, focus on heaven, get rid of the sin, and start living holy lives. And last week, Ken gave us that example of taking off the dirty clothes, the ones he used to close the barn. That's taking off our sin and putting on fresh, clean clothes. That's what we're to do, put on Christ-like behavior. And so as we get to the end of chapter 3, we will be looking at how this should show up in our relationships, specifically the close ones that we have at home. So let's start. I'm going to, we'll read the passage, but I'm going to go back one verse to 17, because it gives us the context. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they'll become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, if the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you have a master in heaven. So Paul's looking at three close relationships. He's looking at the marriage one, he's looking at the parenting one, and he's looking at the slave owners. And in our society, the, the corollary is the employer-employee thing. And he's telling us how to have mature Christ-like relationships in these situations. And as we go through this, I want you to keep a few points in mind, right? In each relationship, there's one person under authority and there's one person in the authority, but nobody gets a free ride. Both have responsibilities, okay? Another point, this is not about an individual's worth. Not at all. All people, men, women, children, they're all equal before God. That's really clear elsewhere in the Bible. Paul is just looking at order, addressing order like military rank. You have to have some kind of ranks or order if you want good functioning. You know, it avoids the rule of the strongest or basically anarchy. And it's actually similar to what happens in the Trinity. We have God the Father. We have God, Jesus Christ, God the Son. And they're both purely God, except Jesus submits to God the Father. Who does? It's a similar thing. And a third point, this is a controversial passage. It's an understatement. <laughs> but back in New Testament times, it was controversial too. Because back then, men had the ultimate authority over their children, over their wives, over their slaves. They were considered to be owned and they could do with them as they please. They could be loving, they could be harsh, they could be cruel, they could be domineering, and no one would say anything about it. That's the way society worked. So this passage was pretty counter-cultural back then, but it did give dignity to those that are under the authority. And in our times, we live in an individualistic society. Everybody's independent. No one wants authority over us. In fact, we see now everybody's their own authority, right? Uh, there's, there's a word for that. It's called pride, and Christ hates pride. And it's also controversial now. Some will claim that this was just in Paul's culture 2,000 years ago. It does not apply to our culture. Or they'll say, Paul is just speaking for himself. It's really not what God had intended. But I think that it's only controversial because we don't want to listen to it. We don't want to obey it. That's why it becomes controversial. So in another concept to keep in mind, these are not suggestions, right? These are commands. If we're looking at inspired scripture, we can't just pick and choose what we like and ignore what we don't. Paul doesn't say here, maybe, kind of if you feel like it or you're having a good day, then you could consider doing this. These are just point blank commands, right? Um, and we wonder why would God give these kind of commands? Right? Well, who's ever owned a car? Almost everybody, not everybody, but. And what comes with every new car? 
It's called the owner's manual, right? And it tells you what to do. It's got a maintenance schedule. It tells you when to, when to change all the fluids, when to change the oil. And you can change it and listen to them, or you can decide that you know better and see what happens with your vehicle. You know, with our car, the manufacturer who made it knows best how to take care of it. And with us, our manufacturer, God who created us, knows best. He knows how to take care of our relationships. And if we look back at verse 17, right before our passage, you know, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That needs to be the attitude behind our relationships. Is it in the name of the Lord Jesus? So let's start with the first one, probably considered the most controversial one. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And submit is basically defined as yield your rights. Let the other one make the final decision. If you disagree, let the husband make the final decision. And notice it's voluntary. It tells the wife to do it. Nowhere does it say, hey husband, it's your job to force your wife to submit to you. Nowhere. It's voluntary. And remember, submitting does not mean lesser worth at all. It doesn't mean that. So why in the world would God say this? Some people really don't like this command. Right? He tells us right there at the end of the verse, it's fitting in the Lord. Basically means that's how God wants it. Right? And he made us, that's how he wants it. He doesn't say, submit to your wives because your husband is a godly man and he's doing everything the Lord wants. Not at all. It just says do it. So might there be limits to this? This is a blanket statement, right? It's pretty short and it's a pretty blanket statement. But like lots of other commands in the Bible, there's a big blanket statement that covers almost everything, but there can be exceptions, right? I'm not saying pick and choose what you want, but there can be exceptions, and there are throughout the Bible. So it, it, it doesn't, it says to commit, submit clearly, but yet I think there can be limits to it. It's not just, you know, submit if your husband is godly, submit if your husband's smart, submit if he's not a jerk. It doesn't say that at all. But I think the limits are, are, some of them are clear. If you remember when Peter the Apostle, in early in Acts, he was arrested for preaching, right? He got out of jail, and the, the ruling authorities commanded him, quit preaching this, don't say this, you're causing trouble. And what did he say? I'm going to obey God, not man. In other words, I'm not going to submit to you, right? Because what you're saying is not what God says, right? So if a husband is asking a wife to sin, I think that's a clear biblical reason. You don't have to submit or comply, right? And there's probably a few others. You know, if there's violence involved, if there's physical abuse, because that's kind of tolerating sin. That is sin, and you're tolerating it. You know, and then there's other ones. What if he's incapacitated? If he's drunk when he's telling you to do something? You know, or what if he's mentally incompetent? But please be careful how you define that. Right? But, but I think there probably are some, some spots where you can um, decide that it's, it's, it's okay not to submit. But overall, the command is submit to your wives because God set it up that way. So let's go to the other side of the equation. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. That's the other side of our relationship. And notice the husband's told two things, right? Love them and don't be harsh with them. And this is not the romantic, erotic, brotherly love thing. This is agape love, which is the self-sacrificial love. You know, love is patient. Love is kind. It is not <clears throat> boastful. It does not envy. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Remember that part. It's not self-seeking. Not easily angered. Keeps no record of wrongs does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So that's the kind of love the husband is supposed to show for his wife. There's a parallel passage to what we we're, we're, have read here. It's in Ephesians, and it's actually quite, quite extensive. It's much longer. And Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So how much is a husband supposed to love his wife? What did Christ do for the church? 
He died for the church, right? He died. That's how much we're supposed to love our wives. And I'll add a little spoiler. In the Ephesians passage, it also says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It goes both ways. It tells the husband to submit there too. And if you have mutual submission, you should be able to get along. Right? We're both to put the welfare of the other first. Okay. So first command for the husbands is love. Second one is don't be harsh with them. And the word that Paul uses is don't get bitter with them. You know, if you think back to a couple, they get married, they're on their honeymoon, they're full of bliss. Are they bitter on their honeymoon? Well, if they are, they're in for a real rough ride, right? You don't start bitter, right? But it happens. It happens. You know, people let little offenses build. They'll hold grudges. They won't forgive. And then they get bitter with each other. And it's a mess. You know, and the God gives a solution. You know, forgive quickly. We're told to forgive before the sun goes down, right? Settle your arguments before the sun goes down every day. And back in the definition of love, it said, it keeps no record of wrongs. Don't hold on to those things, right? There was a husband and a wife. They'd been married for a while. They were having trouble. And they were angry at each other and they were holding grudges. And they'd been giving each other the silent treatment for days. Okay? And then the husband realized, oh no, I gotta get up at 5 a.m. tomorrow to catch a plane. And if she doesn't wake me, I'm not getting up, right? So, what's he do? He's too proud to break the silence, so he writes a little note, puts it beside her pillow, and it said, please wake me at 5 a.m. Right? So the next morning, he wakes, 9 a.m., missed the plane. Furious, right? He's about to let her have it, and then he looks down, and beside his pillow, there's a nice little note that said, it's 5 a.m., wake up. <laughs> so, don't let the offenses build. Don't hold a grudge. Don't become bitter. You know? You know, and if we're honest as husbands, when's the last time we got annoyed or irritated with our wives? When she didn't do what you wanted, she did something you didn't want, she didn't live up to your expectations? You know, when Christ died for the church and we're expected to give up our life for our wife, getting angry about these little things looks pretty foolish. It really does. You know, so what if a wife is unloving? What if she's rude? What if she rejects your love? What are you supposed to do there? Right? Does it say, husbands, love your wife if she submits to you. Love her if she's kind. Love her if she loves you back. Not at all. You know? Think back to what Christ did. He didn't die for us because we loved him. You know, Romans 5 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. He died for people while they hated him. Right? Not because we loved him. So we're responsible. The husband is responsible to love no matter what's happening back. You know, don't wait for the other to set the example. You know, if you're supposed to be the leader in the house, then just set that example yourself. You know, who's ever been on a long car ride with kids in the back seat? Never, right? And when they're getting tired and grumpy after a few hours, what do you hear one of them say? He hit me. He hit me. And the next thing, well, he hit me first. As if that excuses it, right? You know, the other's behavior does not excuse ours. We're all responsible for our own attitudes, our own actions. So in this marriage relationship, you know, both are submit to, e to each other. The husband's to love and he's to love with self-sacrifice. That was revolutionary in the New Testament and it's way too rare in our culture. Right? We're to submit like Christ, we're to love like Christ who died for us and it's not conditional on anybody else's behavior at all. And here's something you already know, it's not easy. It's not necessarily easy, none of us are perfect at it and we might need to repent where we failed. Sometimes it's really hard, but you know, God will not ask you to do what he doesn't give you the strength to do. So we all can do it. Okay. 
So, parents and children, you know, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And the children he's referring to are the children living at home under their parents' authority, not the ones that are married and have their own kids and live outside the house. And there's just one command, which is obey. You know, and obeying your parents was always part of God's plan. If we look back in the Old Testament, disrespecting the parents was a capital offense. It was the death penalty is what it said way back in the Old Testament, right? So God always wanted it that way. And again, it's not conditional. It's not obey your parents because they gave you what you want. It's not obey your parents because they let you stay out late. It's just obey your parents. And again, with every blanket statement, there's probably some exceptions. The same as with marriage. Not if there's sin, there's abuse, incapacity, those things. And fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. And the word for fathers here is father and mothers. So it applies to both, right? And embittering means exasperating them, irritating them, provoking them, stop nagging at them, right? Ephesians says, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In other words, teach them God's ways, but don't give them, drive them crazy while you're doing it, right? And if we're honest, we'll all admit we aren't perfect parents and we haven't been perfect parents. In fact, every parent is a rookie one time around, right? And it goes on for like 20 years. Right? Yeah. You know, many people will say, but wait, no, no, I'm a decent parent. I do not exasperate my kids, right? But I ask you, have we ever helicopter parented them? Taught them not to trust us? Have we ever compared them to others? You know, your brother doesn't do that. You know? Teach them that they're inferior? Have we given them unrealistic expectations, you know, in sports, in their career, in their schooling, so they give up? Have we withheld affection, so we teach them that love's conditional? Have we been inconsistent in discipline, so they're insecure? Have we criticized them? Or have we nagged them, so they just learn not to listen to us or respect us? I suspect all parents have exasperated their kids at some time. I mean, I have, certainly, you know. Right now, our society has an epidemic of youth mental health trouble. It's huge. Anxiety, depression, suicide. And there's going to be a lot of causes for that. But I wonder how much has modern parenting or a lack of biblical parenting been a part of that. And we don't want to be part of that, right? You know, and if we, if we do exas exasperate our children, how do you expect them to accept our faith at all? I know a number of families. The parents were leaders in the church. They drove their kids crazy, and their kids have nothing to do with the church. Nothing, right? There was a huge study done over a decade ago in Canada. It's called Hemorrhaging Faith, and it was about why the young adults leave the church. And they came up with four main reasons. Hypocrisy, judgment, exclusivity, and failure. And these can all happen at home. Parents can be part of this, right? That's a strong warning. So it's important how we treat our children. Don't exasperate them. Okay, let's move on to the slaves and the masters. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Slavery in Old Testament or New Testament times, 2,000 years ago, was different than what we think about slavery of the past 400 years, the slave trade. In Rome, more than half the people were slaves. Half of them. And it went from menial domestic slaves, skilled tradesmen, and professionals, teachers, physicians, all those people could be slaves. And they generally lived with the owner in their home. Think back to Joseph in the Old Testament, son of Jacob. He was sold into slavery by his brothers, went down to Egypt, and he became the trusted household manager of a high-up government official. So it's a, <clears throat> it's a different situation. They lived with the family.
<laughs> and here Paul is not condoning slavery. It was just part of society right from time immemorial. He's just promoting integrity and fairness in the relationship. So if we think about how that applies nowadays, if you think of workers and their employers, right? The employee's supposed to be industrious, diligent, not lazy. Don't work just when your boss is going to check up on you or watch you. Do it as if working for the Lord. Because even if your boss isn't watching, <coughs> God's watching and he's expecting this. He's expecting integrity, which is defined as doing the right thing even when no one's looking. Right? Howard Hendricks told a story about this. He used to fly a lot on American Airlines. And he watched the flight attendant on one of the, one of the flights. She was taking care of crying babies, rude and demanding passengers, drunk businessmen, and she was polite and kind with every single one of them. So at the end of the flight, he went up to her and he asked for her name so that he co could compliment her to her boss. And she just looked at him and said, Mr. Hendricks, I don't work for American Airlines. And he's going like, what are you talking about? She said, I work for Christ. Right? So she knew who she was working for, and that set her attitude and set her actions. Right? Hey, and the masters, it's very straightforward here. It says, treat your employees fair and be just. You know, provide your slaves what is right and fair because you know that you have a master in heaven. Be fair with them because you will answer to your master in heaven. So, in summary... We looked at how we're supposed to conduct ourselves in our relationships, the close ones at home. And we owe it to Christ, given what he has done for us, given that he's redeemed us and gave his life for us, and he knows better. We're to put off our sin, we're supposed to put on Christ-like attitudes and behavior. And God tells us how that looks in our house. So some are in authority over others. The husbands are to love their wives and not be harsh with them. Children are to obey their parents and parents are not to exasperate them and the employers are commanded to be just and fair so let's admit none of us has been perfect at this none of us right we might need to repent to God to our spouse to our children to our employees or our employer but we're all ultimately under God's authority and we will eventually answer to him and please remember, these are not just suggestions. These are commands that came from Christ who created us, who knows what's best. He wrote our owner's manual, it's called the Bible. Right? And it might be easy, it might be tough, it might be really, really, really tough, right? But God will give us what we need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you created us. You know us better than we know ourselves. We fall short in our relationships. We're not always Christ-like. We don't submit. We don't obey. We don't show love. We don't act with integrity. Please forgive us when we sin. Help us to be Christ-like, to be righteous, and to be loving. Please heal our relationships so we can experience what you designed for us and so we can be a good example to the world around us. Amen. So this is going to bring us to the Lord's Supper. You know, we've been considering how we need to get sin out of our relationships and how we need to put Christ-like behavior back in them, right? And we're all guilty. And when we're guilty of not doing that, that's called sin. And the Bible makes it clear that the wages of sin is death. And death means eternal separation from God in hell. But God provided the way out. You know, Romans 5.8 but God demonstrates his own love for this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. The death of a sinless Christ upon the cross. He voluntarily sacrificed his life in our place. That's the epitome of love. And if we believe in Christ, we confess him as our Lord, we'll be saved, we'll be in heaven with him eternally. And now as we take the Lord's Supper, we do this to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Can the men that are serving please come up? So first we'll pass the bread that symbolizes Christ's body that was broken for us. Then we'll pass the juice which symbolizes his blood. And please consume it on your own timing. And then we'll pass baskets to collect the empties. 
So if you're a believer, please join us in this. If you're not a believer, please let it go by. And if you're a believer who has sin or unforgiveness in your life, please let it go by too and make it right so next week you can partake. Let's pray. No, sorry. I'm going to read from Matthew first. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us despite our sins. Thank you that you want us to be with you, but sin gets in the way of that. Thank you that you sent Christ as the sinless sacrifice on our behalf. He paid the penalty for our sins that we could never pay, and now those who believe in your Son can be with you in eternity. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you again for sending Christ. Thank you for his blood that was shed on the cross that we may have forgiveness of sins, something that we could never earn ourselves. So our benediction comes from Philippians 1. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen.